Welcome to the Inspire Podcast. This week, I interview LinkedIn account director, Anthony Wetham. Anthony talks about his time in the British Army, serving as an officer on two tours of Afghanistan with the rifles. We look at the mindset required to lead in pressure situations and how he took advice from his mentor on the battlefield. Anthony then explains his transition from the army to the corporate world and the transferable skills he called upon. Anthony is passionate about helping ex-military in the workplace and explains how misconceptions around veterans remains a challenge during the hiring process. Expanding the point that we must remove the idea that ex-members of the armed forces fit neatly into the boxes of hero or hurt. A fascinating insight into the world of the military and the corporate environment. I hope you enjoy. So Anthony, welcome to the Inspire podcast. Um, delighted to have you here and uh, very interested in talking through, uh, firstly, military background uh, and then into your uh, career at LinkedIn. Um, firstly, aged 25, you made the decision to uh, to go into the military. Uh, what provoked that uh, decision? Yeah, I think it's a, I was a, a late joiner, as, as you yeah. can rightly point out, joining at 25. So I'm um, partly boredom um, and kind of boredom of, of the mundanity of what I saw as just a day in, day out uh, lifestyle. I was I was working in recruitment at the time, mid-recession, um, placing media sales uh, people into, you know, by press online and offline, uh, selling advertising. Um, and then I was... I probably shouldn't say this given that you work in recruitment, but I was trying to get my call stats up. Uh, So I called up one of my mates uh, who was sat outside a courtroom uh, with one of his guys who was in trouble for something or other. uh, And I chatted to him for half an hour and that was useful for my call stats. (laughs) Uh, And uh, and I just thought that's a more, you are doing something much more interesting than I am, uh, which is trying to get my call stats up uh, to prove that I'm hitting my KPIs as well as my numbers. Um, And like even that, which he viewed as the kind of most mundane boring bit of his day uh his week was more interesting than what i was doing and so i kind of went okay let's let's go and have a look at this so um signed up uh to be an officer so signed up to go and join join soundest and and do that year's worth of training okay so was that the uh, you almost had that um light bulb moment of what am i doing here phoning your mate for 30 minutes just to your call stats which i get uh, totally um to go from that though into the military had it always been in your mind it, it, you, is it was it generationally been in your family or what what was what was behind the decision to go into the military yeah so i don't come from a military family I, uh, one grandfather was in but only during the war Um, so there was no kind of generational push to get you in in fact uh, it's not too far a step to say that my parents are both pacifists my dad's a vicar and there was no kind of um, drive to to push me there from from family I think actually equally I I marched anti-war in Iraq uh, and I was uh, at the time I, I didn't agree with the reason that we'd gone into Iraq but um, understood that I thought there was a place for me in the armed forces yeah. um, in terms of yeah all the exciting stuff that you see on uh, on adverts to just what my friends were doing there and probably a degree of arrogance that went I think I can lead people yeah I think okay. I can I think I'd be good well placed to do that yeah, so that was the decision to go down the officer route, Sandhurst. Um, what was what, what what was that like then for a, for a twenty five year old? Because w- was the majority of intake a, a lot younger? So there are three intakes into Sandhurst. There are those that that join in September who tend to be those that have always wanted to join the army. Mm. Um, obviously gross sweeping generalizations um those that are in may now they've at least had a bit of a gap between university or school or whatever it is that they've done before um so tend to be a little bit older um i was chronically unfit i was probably about as unfit as i am now um when i uh, when i joined so not only was i was i old although yeah the bulk of the intake sort of if i look at my platoon which had sort of 30 odd people um i guess ages range from maybe 20 to 26 27 um but yeah i was definitely at the upper end of that and definitely at the lower end of fitness um and 
yeah, what what was Sandhurst like? So Sandhurst is it's three terms. Uh, as long as you don't get injured, if you get injured, you get back turned and sort of redo another term um, or two or however long it takes for your injury to, to recover um, or if you're just not assessed as being ready yet. Um, I viewed it as a process. Like it's it's uh, it's quite a fun thing to do. Um, you do your sort of rapid training to, to ensure that you can you can basic soldier uh, and then you go into more of the the tactics the values um, all the military values and standards and then the sort of detail of okay well this is this is the role of an officer and then you when you pass out the sort of commissioning parade which is basically you graduating mm. um, you then leave as generic army officer second lieutenant so one one pip on your shoulder um, and then you'll go on to your further um, sort of further skill set further skill at arms training um, I'm probably going to get some of these not quite accurate in terms of terminology um, but so from there as generic army officer you then go and learn how to be a logistician officer or an engineer officer for me I went on and, and learned how to become an infantry officer um, which consists of digging holes in the middle of Wales um, and running up and down screaming in, uh, in simplicity. <laughs> right, okay. Okay, and what was the, the uh, I think you mentioned three terms, so so what's the actual time scale in terms of the training aspect and then um, how you obviously then went into your speciality, how, so two questions here, one, how long was that training and then secondly, when did your first tour uh, arrive? Yeah, fair, so... Your, your training is basically an academic year think, right, okay. think school so okay. British Army modelled on a public school they look like Sandhurst looks like a public school mm. it feels like a public school and actually when I explain the army to people after I've left I'll describe it as okay so my job as an officer was I was initially a sort of head of head of a form uh, and I had some very aggressive prefects who are my non-commissioned officers and mm. um, mine is an unfair term but they were the non-commissioned officers that, that I worked with and um, yeah, so that that sort of year, academic year, and you have holidays as you would expect in terms of a of a school holiday, and then you have your sort of fourth term of Sanders, which is your training in Brecon in Wales uh, for those infantiers, and I've no idea what sort of artillerymen or engineers go on and do, presumably blow stuff up and build yeah. it. Um, but uh, but yeah, in terms of. I, so I joined I joined the Rifles, uh, which if you've ever read or watched a sharp um, book or, or film. Uh, their uniform, their sort of mess dress is is based on sharp. So I basically joined a TV so you show. Sean Bean, were you? I, yeah, that was the, that was the hope. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, de- desperately trying to be Richard Sharp. Um, and uh, so you you kind of go through, you become, you get your cap badge, um, you join. Sorry, your cap badge is your regiment. So you join the rifles. Uh, went to Brecon. Now a further slight oddity so because I was armoured infantry which means uh, that we sort of use what look like tanks but are armoured personnel carriers called warriors um, we, you then have to after you've done your standard infantry training you then have to do armoured infantry training which is another sort of half term um, added on the end which is all the sort of both the tactics of using warrior how to drive one although you never get a licence for it um, a bit of how to fix one although mm, I couldn't fix one um, but you could pro- vaguely point at something with a spanner uh, or at least no that is a spanner um, and um, and so immediate so in essence I did sort of those four and a half five terms of training and then because my battalion which was five rifles based in Germany were already deployed I apply, I, I deployed about a week maybe two weeks after my final training uh, and I'm picked up my platoon um, on operations in Afghanistan okay. pretty pretty quickly after training. So, so what, what was that, um, I guess so you, you've landed in, in, in Afghanistan, you, you, you're a week or two out of training, um, did, was, there, was there any point that you thought, wow, what have I done here, or were you just like, like this is me, I'm so into this, I've made the right decision, I can lead these men? I, I, uh, you know me reasonably well I think I am um, I'm constantly thinking what have I done here <laughs> that's just generally yeah. uh, and um, I so the, you do a thing called pre-deployment training which for, for us was sort of three four days in in Lid uh, and is just making sure that you've 
you know you've got all the tactics techniques and procedures sort of sorted for if you come across an id what what do you do and they open with this this won't be new to any of you um and i was there frantically taking notes because it was absolutely new <laughs> to me and i knew i was going out in a few days after um so i think I hope uh, that I was able to project an image, image of, look, I know what I'm doing, but you guys have been here for longer. Um, so I'll just let you guide me. Um, the reality was, yeah, ab- absolutely. I, I knew the I knew the pamphlet. I knew what you're supposed to do. The reality of what you do can differ somewhat when you're on the ground. Yeah, so it was te- I guess it was testing, um, testing not only your training but testing your your own character as well. Um, because I guess if you, I think you said was it thirty people within your uh, platoon, you know you're you're the leader at that point, and you're having to to really look at yourself and and your leadership style and what 20, 25, 26 years of age probably uh, is relatively young to lead. Um, is is there anything any highlights from um, that those tours that you you look at your management style and you think you know what I, I did a good job there so I think um I was very lucky when I um was was given the platoon that uh, that I was given that I there was a very very strong platoon sergeant there uh, and the, the platoon was was in essence split into two um and we, we, we both had a sort of shared shared liking of, of motorbikes and both had the same same first name which which meant led to a sort of easier sort of first meeting and his his words to me when i met him on the ground in afghan was with various fallout words um don't don't go metal chasing yeah um you have achieved um, and you have the right to wear your medal on your chest and indeed um, have the right to be proud as long as you bring all, all the guys home. Yeah. Um, so take this as your gypsy curse and other words um, to, to go like, don't let me hear that you've taken your half of the platoon because we were in separate locations. Don't let me hear that you've, that you've gone medal hunting. Uh, so I think in terms of kind of that, that leadership that... I didn't necessarily see it myself because I was still very much learning, very much learning on that first tour. Um, I actually saw great stuff in in him. So he's a non-commissioned officer. So he promoted from rifleman to lance corporal to corporal to sergeant. Um, and his his ability to gain complete trust from the, from the guys, and you know, whilst being really, I mean, it's quite a strict bloke in, in mm. reality. You know the 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 platoon would always look good they'd always be on time um and like that discipline that he installed um coupled with a willingness to do everything so the guys would do anything that he asked because he would a have the ability to do it themselves and would have willingness to do it themselves yeah. and quite often would do it himself and so i probably learned actually whilst yeah you learn the you know the the book form the the kind of the guidance of what to do when i learned the most initially from him Mm. in terms of okay this is what this is what good leadership is rather than which is i guess an oddity in terms of rather than looking at the sort of hierarchy of the army and looking at you know the generals the colonels and everything else down to go that's absolutely leadership i sort of I say look down is is incorrect, but I suppose in an army hierarchy it's accurate. But definitely looked across uh, to my platoon sergeant and went, no, that's leadership. Mm. Um, that ability to say, I'm going here, come with me, yeah. um, or rather, they're already coming with you um, yeah. because because you've led the way. Yeah. Um, I hope yeah. that kind of further down the line, I then I then started to embody that, um, and I definitely then started to learn from others. But I'm constantly learning and understanding that. It's a big debate, isn't there, between management and and leadership. Um, um, certainly, my understanding of it is that, and it, it was personified by by him. Uh, of this is what I'm going to do. I'm very capable at doing this. Come here, and he didn't know everything, and he pulled in other people that are that are experts. Mm. But you would always know that you could go and ask him because if he didn't know, he'd find someone that did. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, in the in my kind of my role now and and it in any other role that's that's what i want to be able to do uh, i don't manage anyone at the moment but you you know 
work within a team and it's nice to be able to go to those new starters okay cool no I don't know the I don't necessarily know the answer to that but I can find out a few fairly quickly mm-hmm. um, yeah I think the, um, the the first message that, um, that that this guy gave to you is so strong and simple bring those guys back safe and don't put yourself before them and that is such a strong leadership message and then following on from that by in, in like you say you reference the book of leadership mm. people always talk about don't they don't ask anyone to do anything that you're not willing to do yourself but in that scenario I guess it would be really easy to ask people to do stuff you wouldn't do yourself so I, I can see that you've you've clearly probably had this guy's mentor yeah. um, and, and it's great that you're able to reference that and probably look back now and go do you know what that was such a such a great management uh, mentor that, that you had um, and, and you obviously uh, doing two tours out there I um, guess you would have been become that mentor to somebody else and pass that message <laughs> yeah. pass that message on uh, which is uh, which is great um, so so following on from uh, you, I mean, you did six years um, six years uh, in the military which is you know absolutely be proud of what what was your route out yeah. how, how did this come about so I think yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll cover off before I get absolutely destroyed by anyone that is still serving or has done a decent <laughs> amount of time so six years isn't a long time in the army right okay. um, so military in general mm. um, so <laughs> Yeah, minimum realistically being three years, but many will do twenty-two years. Uh, and I, you know, fair play to them. Um, they are, uh, they learn an awful lot, and we'll potentially come on to kind of some of the challenges that they face when, um, when leaving. But yeah, sorry, did you, your question again? Yeah, so um, you, you're at the end of your six-year period now. What was your route out? Yeah, so the armed <laughs> forces is. is the only organisation that I know that will assist you in leaving it uh, and they'll assist you by giving you training and in essence giving you money to, to learn a new skill, learn a new trade um, or just get a, a deeper understanding of something that you're interested in. Um, you have a, a year's notice period so when you when you hand in your notice it's called signing off uh, it's a, it's supposedly a seven seven click process on a on a computer significantly more clicks than that but it's still known yeah. as your seven clicks to freedom um, and uh, and that's an interesting analogy anyway in terms of well is it freedom or is it just just a change but um so I I came back from my um, from my second tour and decided that it was it was time for me to go um, so I I came back from, from Christmas time and ended up signing off and then I got posted to go and train troops in Canada uh, so I did about six months of training troops in Canada during my resettlement which makes it slightly harder to find a job and <laughs> like equally at the same time like no it's not as if anyone's going to be interested in you for employment when you've got six months left of, of being employed by someone else like I can't work for them some do but you can't legally work for them um, so I the the process I went through is not the right process and I do a decent amount of talking around lessons that people can learn from my errors um, so uh, I signed off um, I arrogantly knew that I had a, a reasonable CV because I've been in recruitment before the army um, it was okay it wasn't a brilliant CV um, <laughs> but um but I, I understood the construct. I wasn't going to write six pages. Um, I wasn't going to kind of tell you every nuance of my life. Um, and then, and then I, I just left. I sort of I remember leaving camp, um, and no one could live, give me a lift to the station. So I got a got a taxi to the airport because I was based in Germany. Uh, flew back, um, flew back to my house. I've been fortunate enough to to be able to buy a, a place in St Albans, and um, moved back there and went right. I guess my next job is finding a job uh, and I still had some time on my resettlement um, and then I day in day out uh, logged on to the officers association uh, to see what jobs they were posting to indeed a bit to LinkedIn although in honesty not a great deal at the time um, and you know typed in jobs for jobs for ex-forces and I figured that you know I'd, I'd Managed teams, I've managed equipment, I'd managed projects. The obvious move for me to do was to move into project management. So yeah, so I kind of decided that um, the project management would be 
a obvious route. Um, but like, because I didn't really know what, what I wanted. Um, and I had a couple of interviews at, at a couple of places. And then with about a month left to go, I panicked. Uh, and I was in a state that most ex-forces get find themselves in of going... I'm about to fail to be a civilian. Uh, you know, my, my Google history consisted of job hunting and how do you sign back onto the armed forces? Uh, and I sort of started to make touch with mates back at my battalion, just, mm. just wondering what, what, what sort of roles are going for a, for a captain at the moment, wondering if there's anything I can be doing. Uh, and then fortunately, I, like, of the interviews that I'd gone to, I got offered two jobs in the same day, uh, and I picked one, which was working for a company called P-Cubed um, in a uh, management consultancy capacity and that was interesting different um i was definitely i definitely felt valued i felt like they um they placed a value maybe maybe more value than necessary on on me being ex-forces um but and i I got along with my my team there but it wasn't quite the right fit um in terms of it didn't feel like a sort of overarching goal yes we need to get the project completed but at the same time it would be nice to get more people onto this project and get some more money uh, towards the management consultancy mm. um, and yeah so very fortunately the one of the uh, in fact the eager guy that was my mentor at, at Michael Page tapped me on the shoulder whilst I was at, at PQ and said do you want to uh, come and look we've got a, a job at LinkedIn your ex-recruitment I've worked with you in the past uh, and I said no, I don't think I've got any interest in recruitment. And he said, go and do your research and call me back. So I did and called him back the next day. Yeah. Uh, and then started what's quite a long process of, of getting into LinkedIn, a good couple of months, if not three, um, to kind of get it getting into that world. Yeah, Yeah. okay. So the, um, the, the LinkedIn aspect of it then, so um, had LinkedIn been uh, a business you were aware of at the time and the culture that it had or... So... <laughs> I was aware of LinkedIn probably in the same way that others are aware of LinkedIn. I had it as an app on my phone. Um, I think I had a photo. I had a vague profile. I connected to a couple of people. Hadn't used it mm. in terms of I'd never posted anything. Um, hadn't really read any articles. I remember when it, uh, when it sort of came to our awareness whilst I was at Michael Page in 2009. 2010 and we sort of said can someone do some research into this what mm. what is it is it a threat to us as, as recruiters um i had no real understanding of um of any culture um of what a role at linkedin would consist of because it's an app so am i selling premium uh, like what, what what is it like, i feel like it's premium sells itself it, it sort of chases you around the world um but like I think, uh, as with anywhere that you know, I was fortunate to get tapped on the shoulder. I then went and did my research, yeah. um, and then I had you know images of Google Slides and yeah, and, quick, yeah, and quick, all quickly, the other yeah, 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 very you know quickly you go. Yeah. Oh, hang on a second, this really, <laughs> yeah, it's really looks quite nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, and um, transferable skill set then from uh, from military to uh, a professional working career um, in uh, within LinkedIn. What, what did you deem as your top transferable skills? Um, and do, do you, and, and secondly to, to that, um, do you think they're sort of generic across military that you can transfer over or did you have a unique set? Yeah, that's fair. Um, so I think there are very unique skill sets. Uh, as an infantry, my old job description was to close with and destroy the enemy, uh, which doesn't overly translate to most day-in, day-out workings, right? Um, but... It's for a little bit of sales. Yeah, yeah. occasionally, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. um, um, I think the... But equally, like, you know, if you're a um, vehicle mechanic uh, working on armoured vehicles then you're dealing with seriously high voltage and actually you know what there's a really logical move into electronic vehicles Mm. Um, so you know some of those more core based skills are really really good for that and really really logical I looked at mine and as I said I went right I've managed people I've managed projects obviously project management is a thing for me in terms of LinkedIn well LinkedIn I became an individual contributor again Um, so I had to lean back on those those skill bits and I I tend to be reasonably self-deprecating and would say, well, look, I, I haven't been in sales for, for 
six, seven years, whatever it was, um, by the time I started at LinkedIn. But I have been persuading people to do things that they didn't necessarily want to do. Um, and like, people have various misconceptions around the armed forces. I think that sort of bad lads army or the sort of the shouting of isn't doesn't tend to be a reality um yes ultimately uh with the hierarchy you've got you can fall back on because i say so that's why we're doing it but the reality is that everyone is already swimming in the same direction you all want mm. the same goal you, you're given your mission um you then go and you you take that away and you're given a thing called mission command so mission is given to everyone at, at this level up here and then they go, okay, what does that mean for me? And they go through a uh, process called the seven questions and they work out, okay, so my role in this is what? And they're then allowed, as long as they they accomplish their mission, their route to that is up to them. And I guess, actually, that's that's taught to everyone from Lance Corporal upwards and yeah, various degrees of, of riflemen will, will learn it um, in terms of, this is your way of evaluating what's, what have you got to do? What are the enemy doing? Mm. Like, what's the ground look like? How how can I pull in? Who do I need to pull in? What resources do I need? And what sort of uh, control measures do I then put in place to make sure that it that it works? So that planning element, I think, is fairly transferable, and it's probably pretty across the board. Mm. Um, it's equally pretty hard to make sort of gross sweeping statements about the whole of the armed forces. It's a pretty of large course. piece. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think. The, the most obvious is transferable. I uh, I I quite enjoy process. Um, I get it. I understand it. But that's probably more me rather than necessarily being a yeah. an ex forces thing. And, and I guess the communication is obviously key. And and various um, there's various different methods of communication now in the in the workplace, which we're all aware of. But ultimately, there's the verbal communication, which some people you know struggle to communicate with people from various demographics mm. and I think um, myself from sporting background self from military background I do think that gives us a slight edge having that ability to communicate with all sorts of people that you will come across in in, in potentially um, our backgrounds um, and something you said earlier on in the conversation about the, the guy that was your mentor was his ability if he didn't know the answer he would go away and find the answer by utilizing other people's skill sets and something that you do in our working relationship now if i ask you a question you very upfront and honest to say yeah i don't know that but i'll come back to you within a few hours and i'll give you the answer mm -hmm. and i think sometimes you may not almost know that that's a skill set that, mm -hmm. you, that you have but it is you know absolutely is I, I I don't think there is ever anything wrong with being with being humble and honest about what you do and what more importantly what you don't know. Um, I think there's there's a danger there's a danger that people will say I don't know the answer and I'll come back to you and then don't. Um, and potentially the military gives you that. No, no, I've said I'll do that. I will do that. Yeah. Uh, it might just take me a bit longer. But if it takes me a bit longer, I'll tend to send you a message going. This is taking me longer than I wanted it to, but I'll get it to you. Um, and yeah, I think. I've never really thought about that as being mm. a, being a, a sort of a skill or something you you develop. I I can't think of another member of X Forces that wouldn't <laughs> yeah. wouldn't do it. Yeah, granted, you you get the egos, and and you know I work in sales, so you get yeah. The, the yeah, of course I can do that. I'll, 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 I'll smash my way through that constantly, and you're like yeah, okay. Um, and then irritatingly, often they do, <laughs> and they do really well. Yeah. Um, certainly, my my uh, way of working will tend to be more trying to get an understanding in terms of okay what, what is right for mm. for client what what's going to work here because the LinkedIn format is like well we grow when you grow yeah and that, that works for us and and, um, and this isn't necessarily about um, LinkedIn this is just generally about um, generations in the workplace um, you will have high levels of self-discipline timekeeping respect from your background um, do you think um, generationally that those skills are almost neglected or do, do you think that it's our sort of generation that, that uphold those skills as a, as a premium so I mean, Thai keeping is hammered into you in the armed forces, and you you're like you're always there five minutes before, and you're normally there five minutes before that five minutes before yeah. to make sure you're really on time. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's brutal. I, I always walk into a client's office at about seven minutes too, um, whatever the time is that I need to be there. Um, Self-discipline. I mean, 
Uh, thankfully, this is a podcast, uh, but, uh, but I'm I'm now enormously overweight compared to where I was before. So I, uh, I'm not sure I've got that much of an off switch. Um, I think uh, is it generational? No, I, I I don't believe there is actually a a huge divide between. Gen X, Millennials, I still desperately hang on to the fact that I am just Millennial uh, with, with a 1984 birthday. Um, but um, I'd, to my mind, like if you're, if you're managing a team or you're working with others, then it's all down to what, well, what is that individual strength? What are their, what are their weaknesses? Mm. And yes, it's easy to, to bolt people into, well, look, they are, uh, they're millennials, so they're going to be more keen to chat to people via email or, or message on whatever platform. Um, but the reality is that, well, that was it's always the case, and, mm. and people do tend to go for what what seems the easiest option. There aren't many that are that will volunteer to be the first on the phone. Oh, yeah. please, please let me talk to someone <laughs> that I've never spoken to. That's probably yeah. going to say no. Like there aren't many. There are some, but there aren't many in the world in 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 any generation where that's a kind of go to. I think, and it's very much a personal view, but I. I I think it's just down to the the individuals and how do you like sort of encourage that that discipline how do you train in uh you guys with your with your work on apprenticeships like how do you encourage positivity and indeed positive ways of working in a, in a workforce well that's down to the training that you give and ultimately we we learn from others around us yeah if, if something is acceptable in the workplace then it will be acceptable to you but actually the there's, a, there's an army phrase which is uh, the standard that you're willing to walk past uh, is the standard that you're willing to accept so if if that if you can ingrain that into people's mentality then that that's you going that's that's fine it goes down to litter on the street mm. like if you're happy to walk past a piece of litter that's that's what you're willing to accept you're happy for a world like that in the workforce like if you're happy to not get back to someone when you say you would then that that's fine, but you accept that that's that's the case on on all sides, um, yeah. and, and don't expect any improvement. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great answer, and it was uh, it's always going to be a tough question with this, like say, a sweeping generational thing uh, that we were trying to talk about and clean out, and it's really interesting um, insight that that you that you give of it. Um, LinkedIn, um, could you just give us uh, an overview of the culture uh, that you work within on a on a daily um, a daily basis? Yeah, the culture is it, so. For for a bit of context, LinkedIn, yes, it's an app uh, and it's on the yeah. desktop. And there's a bit more to that. There are about sixteen thousand employees worldwide. Um, and my my role in there is is a, is a sales role, um, so the culture there is insanely supportive. We're we're very fortunate in that we are we are treated as adults. I I, I was asked once what our what our dress policy was, which I took an immediate aversion to because I, I assumed it was a judgment in the, the sort of scrappy t shirt that I turned up wearing. Um, but um, but it's very much a look. You're you're treated as an adult, and th- this is. You know, this is the the quota. This is the amount of revenue that you're targeted to bring in. We will assist you to to do that. We'll work in collaboration with you to get you there. But if you're getting there, then absolutely, we're going to support you through it. So we don't have sort of office hours. Mm. Um, you know, you, everyone that that works certainly in, in my office, everyone that works there is is sort of expected to be m- mature enough and indeed conscious enough that you know they've they've got to hit their target. The target is not particularly low uh, they've got to hit their targets and they've got to get there and, and they do that by managing their own diary and, and getting out and meeting people understanding their clients needs and, mm. and giving the right solutions to them um, it is you know we, we are lucky when I first turned up um, so, so day one I was sort of showing around and I was showing the canteen and they went uh, obviously you get free breakfast and lunch and I went and I'm a cynic and I went okay so what time do I have to be in you're giving me free breakfast have I got to be here at 6am? I'm like, no, 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 it's just a nice thing. And I'm like, yeah, definitely need me in early. And there's no way you're doing that. Um, and it probably took me six, eight months before I went, oh no, it's really just a nice thing. Uh, it's just like, well, if you're here early, then, then have food. Um, like, why, why wouldn't you? And, and lunch is provided and, and all the other kind of perks of a, of a, of a large tech firm. Um, so yeah, you've got, you've got all the, the really nice um 
sort of bits the other ridiculous benefits on our on our healthcare so amy who's who's my girlfriend we accept that families are made up differently to the traditional mold um so she's on my healthcare as a consequence of the fact that we live together uh, but aren't married which meant that she could have a heart operation on our on our health care which is amazing mm. and actually and it's it's things like that 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 make it a re- a uh, sort of ridiculously hard place to ever leave mm-hmm. because you're going yeah but this is this is super supportive yes it's targeted yes you've got to you know with the good stuff comes some pressure um, but like yeah it's it, it's a familial app Atmosphere. It's it's kind of everyone swimming the same way. I think it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's a very interesting point. That and and we look at a model when we talk about culture, um, performance, uh, and trust model, which you probably aware of from the the Navy SEALs and um, most sales organisations. High performance, low trust. Really, what LinkedIn have created is a high trust, high performance model, which is gold. Mm. Uh, but many organisations we'll never get there because they're always just we just want someone that performs really well and yeah they might they might leave and we trust them a little bit but it's how you you shift that culture to trust and what you've just described there is absolutely that Mm. not only them trusting you but you trusting the organization yeah i think i you know i take zero credit absolutely right that i take zero credit for the for the uh for the culture i hope that i've embodied some of it but um jeff weiner who's our previous ceo um outlined leadership by compassion and actually it's it's that sort of caring for the individual um that leads to to great productive teams i'm a big believer in that yes i've, I've probably dropped the linkedin kool-aid but um i'm a big believer in that like compassionate leadership actually gets you a lot further than potentially like yes you, you've hit this big deal but you haven't been on the phone for mm. 25 hours in the last 24 um, like <laughs> understanding a little bit more about what's going on and then being able to look internally to go okay I, I had an issue there but I had an issue there no, it's not necessarily come from the employee the colleague mm. um, the boss it's it's being able and at every level to look at it and go okay well let's let's lead with compassion and let's understand let's try and understand what's what the workings are here mm. um, that gives you that trust um, yeah yeah Okay, um, and I just wanted to, <clears throat> you, you've obviously got a, a huge platform uh, at LinkedIn to be able to influence. Um, are you doing anything now in your role, um, not just at LinkedIn, but your personal role, to help other ex-forces personnel move into professional careers? Yeah, um, thank you for asking that. Um, so that's my, that is my, uh, my kind of, my passion play. Um, I, so... LinkedIn sort of corporate social responsibility piece is is really run by by employees um, that have a passion. So we, the LinkedIn Social Impact Committee um, then splits down into various various sectors. So you know there's um, ex offenders or the young, the elderly or veterans. Um, and I use the term veterans for some debate as to whether or not you should use service leaders. Mm. I use the term veterans because I think most people get it equally. I'll come back to some debates around what, what veteran means for others. Um, what I what I try and do is is get out as much as my job will allow me, given mm. that, you know, I, I have got a target to hit, um, to go and help people to not make the same mistakes that I made in terms of, you know, use what the armed forces gives you in terms of resettlement network find out what other people do that you like or find out what other people do that they don't like mm. and then you know that might not be right for you um but go go and actively explore look at those that have signed the armed forces covenant they're automatically going to be more pro those that are leaving the armed forces so go and have conversations with those um and then the the obvious bits which thankfully my role allows me in as in okay let me help you to to write a better LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Let's let's look at a CV. Let's look at the difference between a CV and a, and a LinkedIn profile and kind of how you can push yourself out. There was a lovely piece actually, um, which LinkedIn did. Um, they ran a thing called the LinkedIn um, and there, it was announced uh, last week that a guy, uh, ex-services guy, got a, got a job as a consequence of turning up to that sort of 
training event or the, the sort of uh, rocking your profile event um, and as a consequence of improving it you got a job at, at the place that you wanted to do which is yeah. which is lovely um, through a couple of uh, couple of sessions that, that we've run at LinkedIn and thankfully my colleagues are always great at supporting um, we've got uh, there's a guy actually who ended up working for a recruitment uh, consultancy who um, it wasn't necessarily what what we kind of told him about LinkedIn it was just that he met people there and he started to get an understanding in terms of okay this is this is what some other opportunities there are at LinkedIn it's not necessarily me going put a good photo on and and write a decent profile but it's more about okay go and meet people go and understand what you might like what your motivators are before jumping in and then going why am I always describing myself as ex-forces rather than what I do now Mm. Uh, for me part of that motivation like I'm I'm proud that I work at a company that if I say the company's name people know it that's a lovely moment for me and status is uh, sadly discovering a, a thing that I like um, but before that when I worked for the management consultancy I would tell you like if I met you I'd go I'm a management consultant but four months ago I was in the armed forces um, because I, I clung on to that yeah. um, uh, don't get me wrong like put half a pint down me I'll tell you I used to be in the armed forces <laughs> but uh, but like it's it's to my mind it's important that you're able to and it takes time but that you're able to define yourself not by what you used to do the armed forces is so all consuming it is it is more than a than a than a job because you're housed as a consequence many will meet their their spouses through it um, you'll be based here there and everywhere throughout the world you won't necessarily know what you're doing at a weekend and so it is all consuming so it's not surprising that you know that it's molded a large part of your life but in terms of that like how can we help those move move forward is going okay well what have you learned it's your, the questions that you yeah. asked me like what are your transferable skills how do we um translate what you've done in the armed forces and put it into civilian English but at the same time make it very possible for those people that will innately want to help with you all of those ex-forces people so that they can still understand what you did Mm. so like very simply um, like platoon commander brackets project manager or whatever it may be but so that like I look at it and go okay platoon commander I know exactly what that was and you look at it and go okay project manager again and and it's those nuances where often I'll look at a profile or a CV and I go I don't know with either my civilian or my ex forces head on I have no idea what you do or did Um, and so yeah there's that sort of education around I think it's the language isn't it it's the language used um, and that almost assumption that people will know what it means and your work with with these individuals will give them will, will one not knock down barriers will open more doors mm. and hopefully by the advice you can give and not only the advice you can give but you're a walking example of somebody that's done very well for themselves and working in one of the largest tech firm tech firms in the world mm. so all of that together gives you a real unique position to, to help these and like you say it's your passion it's your purpose and um it's a real strong purpose as I think, well. I think there's there, there's one thing that it'd be remiss of me not to to comment on when we when we're talking about X forces and you, you mentioned language and assumptions and I think one of the uh, biggest challenges and Deloitte did a did a great piece on it in their veterans work um, and it's it's this challenge and it, it stems around the the word veteran and well what does that mean to people and the the one thing that we all can do X forces or not is try and remove the the stigma around X forces being either heroes or hurt. Um, mm-hmm. So if you say the word veteran, people will tend to think of someone World War II um, or PTSD. And they're the two things that come to mind constantly yeah. with everyone. Uh, or indeed they go, oh yeah, 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 yeah. X forces must be a hero. Um, I, uh, I wrote a piece, but in writing a piece, I did, I did a lot of research to see kind of what, what what had happened to people when they'd gone into the workforce and uh, a guy who I'll keep nameless for now um, sort of his his first day um, turned up there and you know his, his managing director was like oh polish my shoes because you're coming in and like you know lovely and fine and funny but it's still a stereotype that is that is put on that goes yeah. oh, well you know it's very important like I mean I'm one of the scruffiest people going, but um, like, but I was when I was serving as well. That's, that's, that's six one after the other. But I think like what is what is important is understanding that this is a group of people who 
depending on what rage you read, PTSD just as common, if not less so than in civilian world percentage wise. Mm. You know, yes, there are some serious, there are some heroes, but I won't give a statistic. The vast majority of people are neither of those two things. What they are is a group of people who sometimes struggle to find employment coming out of the armed forces, but that have transferable skills or at least a willingness to learn. Mm. Um, I've known a decent number of people that will take a pay cut when they leave the armed forces, a real-term pay cut, because life is slightly cheaper and almost subsidised when you're in the armed forces, um, because of their willingness to go, okay, cool, I'm going to start a new career, this is where I'm going to go. Um, but really, like there, there has to be... And it doesn't need to be a, a massive step change, but a, a slight change in people's understanding that, okay, the bulk of people are, are neither of these, they're just capable. What they don't have is industry knowledge the vast amount of times. Don't get me wrong, Royal Electronic Mechanical Engineer is very good at, think, uh, at fixing stuff, mm. as is an engineer at building stuff. Excuse the generalizations. Um, but but those that are generalists, those infantiers, those uh, artillerymen, those uh, sailors, don't know any detail. <laughs> people in the eye. Um, yeah. Like, there's a vast pool of people there that are very willing, very capable, very quick to learn. It's also some that aren't. Um, but they just don't have the industry knowledge. So it, it part of that process of, you know, how are you helping X forces to find employment also needs to be flipped to how are we educating um, communities and employers about this pool that on paper probably not that strong on paper me at LinkedIn I should never have got the job six years out of sales um, I had a I'm not even sure I had a, a profile picture you know there was no real detail on there I was lucky in that I was referred in and because my then manager went no 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 I used to work with you and I respect what you've done in the armed forces fantastic I don't need that respect but like well, thanks for taking a punt on me um, but like it's just that education piece that goes yeah they're not going to have the five ten years experience in industry but they may have something that's very quickly transferable over mm -hmm. so let's let's try let's have a look yeah yeah and i think um, just backing that up uh when we were doing some work on the um uh, our, our sort of skills charter for, for staff and some of the stuff we were trying to look at diverse um, work streams coming in you, you kindly recommended the, the office association um, to us um, and, and it, it was good it was a, a jobs board type you know we were putting jobs up and we were getting a, a flow of relevant CVs of mm. uh, I think project management experience of you know some huge projects that have yeah. been built yeah. you know you're like wow <laughs> um, but still there's the the education to the client and backing up what you said it's the oh well actually no they haven't yeah no, they've done no residential they've done no build well, well they haven't but you know give them an opportunity to yeah. do so uh so i think there's a, a big education piece and it's there. the same as those leaving leaving sounders right so i learned sounders on paper i've got all the knowledge but i've got no experience <laughs> like I've, yeah. I've, I've played around at like <laughs> leading the other people that are also lear learning you know there's potential officer cadets mm. um, or those office, officer cadets and uh, like you don't know anything it takes time yeah. but you can get there as long as you've got that mentorship as long as you've got that support and yeah, yeah. someone someone to take a pun I need someone to give you an opportunity yeah I know yeah, that, that's I think a pun employs employs that it, that it is a risk it's, it's always a risk right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know as well as I do it can an be a risk regardless it's probably a better <laughs> term yeah, yeah. an opportunity yeah I'll tell you that um, okay Th thanks Anthony so just uh, the f final question is we, we could go on uh, longer I'm sure we might have to do part two um, but the the final question is around um, performing teams so you've worked in uh, the military and you've worked at LinkedIn both high performing cultures high performing teams when you look at a or you envisage a high performing team what what comes to mind or are there any teams sporting teams teams you work with in any sectors that you think yeah, that do you know what that's real high performing team culture yeah so I mean sporting wise I'm a I suppose I'm a Watford supporter by uh, <laughs> by right so I, I won't I won't put too much too much credence on that um, I think to my mind, a there's a danger when people are recruiting a team. They've got a team of three, four high performers. They've started off well. And then they just go, well, that's worked well. 
I'll copy and paste and copy and paste and copy and paste and you end up with uh, <laughs> you end up with the same you, you, you have no diversity of thought uh, and the armed forces they'll call it group think um, and they go look we're you're you're all thinking of it, like you've got the same solution so if the enemy knows our doctrine they know you're going to do that so you must bring in some diversity of thought now diversity is, is talked about a lot in recruitment be it by ethnicity uh, sexuality gender whatever it may be uh, yeah that, that, that list continues in infinitum um, but actually, to my mind, the, the teams that I see performing exceptionally well amongst my amongst my clients at LinkedIn Armed Forces are those that go, that's interesting, that's different. Um, that team's performing really well, but actually, I, there's nothing... If I looked at them, if I looked at that group of five, six, seven people, I wouldn't say they're definitely that team. But that's what makes that team's culture yeah. is is the kind of diversity of it's not saying uh, okay Joanna blogs she she likes this she's good at that she goes to there so she's definitely going to be in that team uh, because that's the culture of that team rather it's like I don't know where that person oh of course they're in that they're in that ridiculously high performing team because they're able to look at each other's strengths and go and with humility go. I'm not great at that and you are what do you do like how do you pull pull that in um, there's a lady at, at LinkedIn um, who I was listening to a podcast on because um, she's she's dyslexic uh, and was talking around that and her um, her manager views it as her superpower because she thinks differently yep. um, and you know, she's ridiculously high performing that team in itself is ridiculously high performing and they've just got diversity of thought um, so my <laughs> Unhelpfully, the the thing that I see, the the sort of generic thing that I see amongst my clients and internally of teams that are high performing is that diversity of thought within them, and then acceptance to a try things and fail quickly, fail quickly and learn, and um, and just just try things, like try things that are innovative and take the idea of the new person, yeah, because they haven't got any of you. You will inevitably get some group thing going. You will. It just happens. Um, so take the ideas of the new person and mine them. So when that new person starts, rather than like, this is your onboarding process, let's tell you everything, you're going to do it this way, this way, this way, it's going to work for you. Yeah, this is how we do it. What do you think's wrong? Hmm. Yeah, I think um, you've just described a book of uh, Principles by Ray Dalio, which is one of the um, top five business books of all time. And you talk about the ability to put people in the right right positions within mm. a project team by someone saying I'm not great at that mm. but I'm really good at this and the manager being able like baseball cards Ray Dalio yeah. has of his individuals yeah. and puts them into teams and, and and what you've just described is is, is that um, so it, it's interesting from having read that book and you describe it I'm just seeing so much mm. uh, coming across which is, which is great description uh, from yourself so uh, uh, yeah, really, really appreciate that. Um, so, Anthony, appreciate your time. Um, the whole idea of the podcast is to inspire ordinary people to achieve great things. I hope some of the content we've been through today uh, will will be an inspiration to uh, to people. Um, we'll put some show notes on for um, a link to Anthony's uh, LinkedIn profile for anyone um, wanting to get in touch with with Anthony if anything they want to discuss in terms of the work he's doing and his passion and purpose around X forces. Uh, but Anthony, appreciate your time a great podcast hopefully everyone thinks the same and uh, yeah thank you thank you mate cheers